fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. I'm going to try and focus today on... Uh, uh, something I saw on Netflix called the Ted Bundy Tapes. And now that was a four-part series. started on January 24th, which is the 30-year year to date of um, uh, Bundy being executed. So um, I, I can't believe it's been that long. So mm-hmm. it just seems like yesterday. And uh, <laughs> uh, Literally. Yeah. <laughs> it feels that way. And so, of course, sitting with us today is the uh, Stephen Michaud, who was uh, the guy that was... One of the guys, of course, with Hugh Ainsworth, that were um, investigating this and putting the tapes together and actually uh, spending time with Mr. Bundy. So um, welcome to the show, Stephen. Good to talk to you, Al, and, and you too, Kevin. No, it's not good to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, <Yeah>. never. <laughs> All no. right, I take it back. Yeah, take that, take that back. You'll see later. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm the mean right. one. Yeah, he's the bad one. He's, he's in the doghouse this week. So... Conversations with the killer. Well, first of all, um, how did you, and I guess you, or how did you guys get to decide this is what we want to do? Like, where did the idea come from, and um, how did it how did it happen? Well, the, the idea wasn't ours. Uh, Bundy reached out to us through several intermediaries, uh, beginning with a uh, a TV reporter in Seattle who had befriended his friend and future wife and mother of his child, Carol Boone. And through this reporter in in Seattle, uh, a couple of, of uh, relatives and husbands and friends, uh, and the whole thing came to my agent's desk in New York City. Uh, and the question was, does your client, Mr. Michaud, have any interest in meeting Ted Bundy and working with him on the true story of his life. And I, uh, uh, at, the mo- at that precise moment, didn't know who Ted was. <laughs> and uh, so I, I looked it up, and it turned out that he was a, 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 a well-known serial killer. And so, of course, I was interested. And I, uh, <clears throat> I sent no... I, word back that yeah I'd, I'd talk to him and uh negotiations began and and an understanding was reached um i would bring along as a as my partner on the project hugh ainsworth uh, an old colleague from my days at newsweek magazine who was and is an excellent investigative reporter and the understanding uh would be that ted at that time was proclaiming his complete innocence of everything and that if somebody really looked at the cases against him, they would find the evidence that he had been framed. So we said, fine, uh, Hugh will go back and start at day one and look for that evidence, and I will uh, come visit Ted on death row and start getting the story from him. And a book would ensue, and uh, if, if, if everything went the way Ted said it should, uh, we'd uh, get a uh, an innocent man off death row. Uh, and if things went the way we suspected they would go, Ted would stay on death row and we would have a hell of a book. So that that was that was the beginning of the whole thing. Wow. Now, now when you say negotiations, um, I'm trying to picture this in my head. What what do negotiations consist of? What did Ted want in return for his story and what were you able to offer? He wanted, he said he wanted, uh, a, 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 a complete and honest investigation because he said that he said he'd been set up. Uh, and so, uh, we could offer Hugh, who didn't work for anybody but himself, 
uh, and had a reputation for not only being good, but being honest. Um, in retrospect, what Ted had in mind was a kind of celebrity biography. I mean, he knew he was guilty, uh, and he was just happy to let Hugo wandering around out uh, in the around the West Coast uh, uh, for months looking for things that that didn't exist. And then he thought that he would just feed me his version of things, which was basically a fairy tale. And uh, the book would uh, would would be published and show him in a happy light, and that uh, the narcissist in him, in him uh, thought that was a just a tickety boo idea. And that <clears throat> that was what was that was what was injuring, moving him from his side. We um, felt that we had one of two things. One or two things was well, maybe more than that. Yeah, maybe you could dissociate Ted from from one or more of these cases. And the way the story had evolved, the way the investigation had evolved, had you been able to, it would have cast out on all of the other cases. Um, and, it, and, and it was possible that, uh, you know, that what Ted said was true or, or true to some extent. The other possibility was that uh, he was guilty as he looked and that I would somehow get, you know, get the story from him and we'd have uh, we'd have the story of a serial killer for, in his own words. Uh, the third possibility, which probably was the m- most likely at that point, was that the whole thing would blow up and uh, uh, and nothing would come of it. So that's that's what we were presented with. Wow. So when you first sat down with him, um, yeah, I would guess he would have been pretty manipulating. Like he would have been. He had an an idea of what he wanted to do, and he was going to use you to do it. Correct. So absolutely. So so uh, I was at. Go ahead. I was just going to say. So when you when you first noticed that, or when it first happened, what what were you going to do to try to get him off that track? Well, I was I was at a a real disadvantage on on a lot of levels. Uh, to begin with, uh, I knew what what uh, sociopathy or psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder. I know what they are, but I know it that because I had you know gotten two weeks of psychology in a health class, maybe five or you know, ten years before, or something <laughs> like that. I had you know I had no real practical knowledge of what a sociopath is like, what they're about. I mean, I was aware that you know they. Are, they're unable to feel any uh, guilt or remorse, um, and that was about it. Well, they're much more complex than that. Um, uh, they're narcissistic. Uh, they're paranoid, typically, um, and um, they uh, uh, are, are archly manipulative. So Ted sort of bounced me around like a like a like a basketball for the first week or so, and we we were talking about his happy boyhood and how he dreamt of being um, uh, adopted by Roy Rogers and Dale Evans <laughs> and his, and his dog Lassie. Oh yeah. And then, and then talked about his, you know, going to high school and going to college and studying Chinese and always wanting to be a lawyer and a Republican. And I mean, it was just, it was plain vanilla and, uh, and it was certainly not, what uh, anything that I was interested in listening to, and it certainly wasn't anything that my editor in New York wanted to be told that I come back with 250 pages of, of plain vanilla pap. So, um, and Hugh, of course, was not finding anything because there was nothing to find. So, um, I was driving back from the prison one uh, day after another one of these sessions with Ted, and I I had, I guess you'd call it an, an epiphany, um, and that is that Bundy, as you will recall, was typically referred to as boyish, boyishly handsome, boyishly, uh, boyish mannerisms, um, and I was thinking about that, and 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 I, you know, I by that time I'd spent quite a bit of time with him, just the two of us in a you know a little room talking, and I noticed the boyishness too. 
But I thought, as I reflected, that maybe the boyishness was 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 real boyishness, that he really was psychologically still a boy, that he had, mm-hmm. say, around age 12 or 13, stopped maturing uh, emotionally, mm-hmm. uh, that he was a case of what we now call arrested development. Right, and hence, I said, hence the that, grand fantasies. Yeah, yeah. Well, that then suggested to me a possible avenue into his head. Um, and the uh, the notion would be familiar to anybody who's ever been around you know, uh, tweeners, as they call them, or young teenagers, is that the the confessional eye is something that a young a, a child uh, will will avoid at all costs. Um, and the example I, I use is, say you're sitting in your living room one day and a baseball comes through the plate glass window and you look out, there's a kid with a baseball bat. You've got a you know, prima facie case that that kid just knocked a ball through your window. But if you go out and say, okay, did you do that to, to Jimmy or Tommy or whoever he is, uh, they are likely to say, uh, no, of course not, I didn't do that. And and they'll stick by that uh, because their fear of being exposed for having done that or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever punishment or, or whatever would ensue, will, will they'll stick with the story. But if you say to them, okay, can you tell me what, how you think it might have happened. If you remove that confessional eye, you might get them to actually tell you the story, as long as they don't have to say, I did it. So, uh, with that very slim thread of an idea, uh, I went back to the prison, and I complained to Ted, as I had every day until then, that the story was going nowhere. And I said, so I have an idea, Ted. Um, you know more about the cases that you've been uh, connected to as a defendant or as a suspect than anybody on earth you've seen all of all of the the investigative uh, reports you've seen all of the legal filings you've seen what the psychiatrists have had to say um, you know all the characters involved uh, in the investigation the lawyers etc so you're, you're in a unique position, uh, to discuss, to discuss the situation, put it that way. Secondly, um, you have a, uh, an undergraduate degree in psychology. And I assume that you know something about uh, aberrant psychology because you have to take that to get a degree. And thirdly, uh, you're, you're manifestly bright and articulate. And you have the ability, I know because I've been talking to you, to, construct a narrative, a story uh, that takes into account all of the variables that we've been talking about and presents a, uh, a smooth-flowing, coherent reconstruction of what happened. Mm-hmm. What kind of person would have done these crimes? What, what would go through his head? What, would be, what were his considerations? What were his fears? What, you know, what were his feelings? How did he do it? And I said, Ted, there's nobody on earth who can do that better than you. Uh, and he kind of looked at me for a moment and uh, he said, well, I can only speculate. And he grabbed the tape recorder and pulled it towards him and off we went. So it all began. He, uh, he basically told me the whole thing, the whole, the whole long saga, uh, in the third person, um, from time to time. He would fall back into the first person and correct himself and, and move on. But it basically was a third person confession, uh, a, a, a third person uh, review of his life as a serial killer. So kind of like the O.J. Simpson, if I did it. <laughs> well, I think O.J. I, borrowed that I, idea from me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. <laughs> I I yeah. didn't do it, but if I did, I would have done it just like this, and it all matches the evidence. That's right. Wow. So yeah. so, how did you um, feel about him as a person? Like when after the manipulation, and he started talking to the um, recorder and voicing as a third person, kind of referring to the murderer as yeah someone else. Um, did you see a change in his person? 
an analogy, or did you see? How, how do you describe that? Well, you can imagine that it was pretty strange. Um, what what has stayed with me all these years is uh, more than anything else was were actually two things, and they, they they're kind of odd taken together. One was that I clearly had given Ted a chance to do something that he really, really wanted to do, and that is relive, talk about his crimes. Uh, as I got to know him and we talked, it was clear that he was pretty proud of what he had done, uh, that he was you know, the world's uh, most serious, no-shit serial killer. And, and I learned secondarily to that that, you know, that he had a lot of cachet on, on death row because he had been on TV twice uh, and that he was, you know, and that he was a badass killer. Uh, and he really that made a big difference to him. Uh, the other part of it was, and this is the sociopathy part that I was not ready for, is that he, he told it almost without affect. Um, if you listen to the tapes, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's really, his voice doesn't modulate much at all. It's, it's steady. Uh, it's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's without any particular drama. Um, it's just a kind of quiet storytelling. And the only times that I could tell that he was, you know, that he was really getting emotionally into it, um, would be, in some of the stories that he told me, some of the recreations of the crimes, his eyes would turn black. I mean, I know huh? it sounds like mel like melodrama, but it's true. He had very nice blue eyes. It was one of his features. And when he but when he got into this thing, um, his eyes he, his eyes would darken. Um, as and I later met a couple of other people who knew him uh, when he was younger, and and they said. Without me mentioning it, they said, you know, when Ted got upset, his eyes always went black. Um, so I'm not the only person who had ever noticed this. Now, one of the uh, one of the other things you need to hear about to understand what it was like is that Ted posited an inner voice, um, and not a second Ted, not a you know, not a you know, not some sort of personal demon. He called it the entity, um, and it was not, you know, it was it was not uh, a ghost or, or or another creature in there invading his brain. It was it was him. It was his his voice, but it would speak to him. And and the the entity was sort of what what directed him uh, when he was out prowling, uh, hunting, and the entity was also responsible for tidying up after he after a kill to do the best that he could possibly do not to get caught because then he couldn't do any more killing so the the entity was the was the third person in the room if you will um and that's how it went hey, oh steve can, can i jump in here for just a moment because i think you're on a, a you're on an excellent point and i just kind of want to unfold it just a little bit more it, you sure. said a You've said a couple of really, really keen things. Uh, first of all, at certain points in the interviews, he would r relate to himself in the third person. Right. Then, um, a little while later, I, I believe you about the eye color change uh, to some extent, and it all seems to make sense. Then, it, you said that he described this entity almost as if a, an exterior force took him over. Right. When you're dealing with sociopaths, it's my understanding, having studied them, that this is not all that unusual because they disassociate themselves so much from what they're doing. They, you're exactly right. They're narcissists. They have a sense of entitlement. But when it comes down to the actual killing, the reason they say that sociopaths don't have any empathy or they don't even really express any type of emotion, it's because they disassociate themselves. Do you think, and here's my question, 
do you think that it's possible that Ted Bundy had so disassociated himself that he created this thought form that allowed him to do these killings, which is why today he thinks he may have a shot at getting away with it. Because, and I'm quoting, air quotes here, I really didn't do it. Well, yeah, you're touching on stuff that 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 I was that I'm happy to talk about because I think much of what you just say is 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 spot on. Um, there was a, I'll, I'll add a couple of things that that may flesh it out a little bit. He uh, he got into a, a three or four times. He got into some some real uh, cat fights with Ainsworth um, and. The, the 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 source of the the, the the irritation was with while I I listened and changed the tapes and lit his cigarettes and and from time to time uh, asked questions um, I tried to be as non-judgmental as I possibly could I just tried to keep a straight face mm-hmm. and keep him talking impartial you yeah I mean uh, yeah because I you know you know. Uh, in any interview, I mean, I've, I've, I've interviewed people my entire professional life, and the first rule is keep them talking, right? Um, Hugh, when Bundy would uh, go off on one of his tangents, he would say, "Now, God damn it, Ted, I don't understand. What kind of what do you get out of sticking a uh, uh, putting a stick in a woman like that? Or, or you know, that's just not right. That's not real." And Bundy would look at him and say, well, of course it's not. Of course it's aberrant. I didn't say it wasn't. And then he would go on and say, but why? Why? And at one point, he uh, he was pushing him, pushing him hard. And Bundy finally said, okay. Uh, it was sort of an inward okay, I think. And he, he went <laughs> into the speech about um, the past. And he said, you know, Hugh, the past is not real. You can't touch the past. You try to touch the past. Show me, show me the past. The past is is gone, and there's only the here and now, and in my case, maybe not even not even the tomorrow. But I uh, I am you know, I, I I am not touched by the past. The past has no meaning. It's not real, and I really feel so sorry for people who are who are caught in the past, who who you know who or, who are full of regrets or or or, or uh, 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 pain over what things they have done. So I don't feel any guilt for anything. I, I feel I'm not guilty for a single thing. And I can tell you, Hugh, it's really, really, really liberating. I feel very sorry for people who feel guilt. So, wow. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And, I mean, there you go. I mean, there's sociopathy, you know, 101. Um, and... Uh, he uh, he did achieve. He, he shut Hugh up for a while. <laughs> it was, you know, it's a, where do you go from there? Um, so those those were the things that uh, that we learned about Ted. Uh, I, I mean, a, apart from the actual murders and stuff, the the uh, the sociopathy is a is a fascinating condition. Oh, I uh, uh, I'm sure I've met a lot of other ones in my day, but n- n- nobody anywhere near Ted. So as you dug into him, did you discover what were his motivations for actually committing these murders? Was it, you know, some type of a reliving the past or sexual gratification or self-glorification? You know, was it a sense of entitlement? What motivated him? Well, there's it's evident from the condition of some of the bodies that were recovered, from the very few bodies of his victims, that he harbored a towering hatred for women. I mean, he didn't just kill them. He clubbed the hell out of them. Um, mm. He mutilated their bodies, and he uh, went back and visited them for days, and in a couple of cases, apparently weeks, after he had killed them. Uh, so th- the anger is, is evident. I mean, and he he repeatedly tried to tried, tried to convince me that that the object uh, was 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 not the actual killing. Um, that he did everything he could within reason, with in in, in an unreasonable situation, 
uh, not to cause uh, undue terror and, and pain for his victims. Um, that was a bunch of bull. Uh, but the other part of it is sort of interesting. He said that the, the ultimate goal um, was possession. And he memorably said, as one would possess a potted plant uh, or a Porsche, and that he wanted he, he wanted to own these dead women, these unconscious women, uh, and play with them. Um, much much like and, Dahmer. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's see, there's a, there's speaking of people who know about sociopaths. There's a, a sense among people who've studied them that that what. The sociopaths really are doing with when they kill people is trying to steal their 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 life force for them because they really are empty people and mm-hmm. they're trying to they're trying to get some some real um, uh, s- some real life force if you will into them and they want to steal it from you they want they literally want to kind of reach inside you and and take whatever it is that makes you a real person um, and. People like Dahmer uh, took it to its illogical extreme by actually physically consuming his victims, uh, and Ted to an extent as well, because he was a, ne- a necrophile. Um, so the 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 rest of it um, was he had he had for some reason, uh, and I, I've never really figured it all out, but he. He was angry, um, and he chose as his victims uh, um, uh, pretty uh, white college girls for the most part. Although he killed a couple of girls who were only twelve, and I think I think part of it I think is he was getting back at a society that he didn't understand um, and and thus feared and hated. And one way of fighting back is to take their most valuable possessions, their young women. Mm. Uh, that and that's makes sense. And, and, and he, he sort of saw himself that way. Um, anyway, you know, I, I mean, I can kind of validate what you what you say. I mean, I, I've I work in corrections and I've worked in corrections for just a little over 20 years now. And yeah. having talked to killers and, and some serial killers, you know, not to the extent that you have. Uh, they will describe, you know, this feeling of being dead. You know, I don't yeah. feel anything, but whenever I killed, that was the one time that I felt most alive. Yep, 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 yep. Well, that's consistent with uh, my friend Ted. Um, but he, but he, you know, he was really, really proud of it. He, he, um, he while he was incarcerated. He sought out other serial killers and tried to talk to them about their experiences. And he uh, he became sort of a therapist, or a, 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 <laughs> a, a not a therapist, a, a buddy and and a confidant. And try, yeah, there you go. That's the word I want. And uh, Bob Keppel, who chased Ted around for a long, long time, who also interviewed him in prison, uh, and I did a. a uh, a book together called uh, Terrible Secrets and, and much of it is Ted talking about his conversations with other killers and and how killers have to hide some of what they've done because they couldn't stand it you know for it, it for it to to receive the light of the day because it was so horrible and he called it their terrible secrets and in his case it was the twelve-year-olds. He wouldn't talk about the very, very young girls that he killed, and uh, and and it's because the the he understood uh, if he if he didn't accept, but he understood that some of the things he did were really, really off the rail, um, and he he couldn't stand to have the world know what a pervert he was. Um, another interesting insight, because I think. Uh, I think the ultimate his self image was of a loser, uh, and what he projected was quite the opposite of uh, you know this self confident uh, genial well spoken young law student and an up and coming young republican, but in his heart of hearts, he knew he was just a goddamn worm 
Hmm. Wow. What, what do you think the biggest surprise was when when you went in and met him and talked with him? Because, you know, experience journalism and, and uh, I kind of know what it's like to meet someone in that same element. But was there something that surprised you about his personality or his likes or dislikes um, that you can tell us? Well, I... I, from time to time, uh, when he was, especially when he was going off on one of his tangents, I would, you know, I would, I'd let my mind wander a bit and, and think about what if I had encountered this guy, you know, in class, you know, in, 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 in college or something like that, or I knew him. And I said, would I get it? Would I, would I detect, um, that he was a sociopath? And, uh, quite frankly, I don't think I would, um, and it, it, it was my observation that the only way you, with Ted at least, that you that you could uh, uh, see the sociopathy um, without any without any clues was to was to basically build a tautology. You had to say, "I know this guy is a is a uh, sociopathic killer." Now let me look for the you know the, the evidence. Um, but you if you if you just met him, uh, he he seemed to fool everybody. Um, he he could be very very funny. I remember one day we got off on a we, I don't know what what they what they, it, how we did this how how it came up, but I said to him, you know, Ted, you ought to uh, you ought to think about doing product endorsements. I said, for instance, crowbars. And, uh, you know, and he took it. It was a piece of very black humor, but because crowbar was his favorite weapon. But then he, he jumps into a completely different character and says, okay, imagine me standing behind bars and, and the camera catches me looking out. Now, Ted had a fetish for socks. When he was arrested in Florida, he had something like 40 pairs of them that he had stolen. And I made fun of him. I said, you know, but it's with you in socks. And he says, so here I am, I'm Ted Bundy, <clears throat> and I'm wearing my Burlington socks, and I'm going to wear Burlington socks to my execution, but it just burns me up that I'll never wear them again, right? And this is, oh, wow. he just ad lips this. <laughs> that's, the, so, that's the biggest uh, of your concerns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you know, he's, he was he was a real day at the beach. Um, but, you know, I think both of us... Came away from the confrontation really surprised at, at, at how it turned out because he was planning on, on, as as you pointed out, he was planning on using me. Um, he was, you know, he was going to create a new TED and send me out into the world to tell the world about it. And uh, uh, I went in and found a different TED and told the world about it. And I uh, and he took me to school. I mean, really took me to school. On, on, on the nature of what some people are capable of doing and what sociopathy really is about. Uh, certainly what it's about when you're also a murderer. So we, we both were transformed, no doubt about it. So now, Carol Ann Boone. <laughs> right. <laughs> what can you tell yeah. us about her? What was did ta Ted ever talk about her and and the daughter they had? Oh yeah. Um, well, she Carol Carol met Ted uh, in the summer of 1974 when they were working together at a Washington State agency in Olympia called the um, uh, Emergency Services DES, I think it was. And uh, Ted was a political appointee, and she was a civilian appointee. Carol was was very bright, um, and uh, and and competent. She was. I talked to people who worked in that office, and she was respected by all of them as the one, as a person who actually was an adult. And so she and Ted sort of became friends, um, and uh, through that summer, and then he took off to go to. Utah that autumn, and she went off on 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 on, on her own uh, trail, and they they stayed in touch with one another, but but only kind of you know now and again. I think she visited him once or twice when he was in 
in Utah. And then she told me that in the autumn of, of 1975, after Ted had been arrested and the first hints had come out that he might be the, the infamous Seattle Ted who had killed those two girls uh, in the summer of 1974 at and, Lake Sammamish. And, um, and she was working in a Vietnamese uh, relocation facility in San Diego and either heard it on the radio or got a call from somebody that said, Ted's been arrested. And she uh, she could not believe it, uh, and as, as most of his friends could not believe it. But Carol went the, fr- the extra step of really reaching out to him um, while he was being lo- while he was locked up uh, in in Utah and then in Colorado, and she sort of supplanted his longtime girlfriend Liz Klepfer and became his uh, his kind of a, his champion. Uh, she she dealt with the press. She was the one who interviewed Hugh and me, uh, and and said, "Okay, you guys are all right." Uh, which she regretted doing. Um, and uh, I met her in Florida, and it was clear that, that you know, you had to go through Carol to get to Ted. Um, and so that's, you know, that's how it worked. When I first started interviewing him, um, it was during his second trial in, uh, in Orlando that uh, uh, I rented a a room at Holiday Inn, and not 20 minutes after I had gotten the room, she and her son showed up at the front door, at my front at the door, and said, "We're staying with you." So the three of us uh, were in this Holiday Inn room for six weeks together, which is a little claustrophobic. Um, And yeah, and uh, then when I started interviewing him in prison, she had moved to to uh, Gainesville and was living there and uh, was was still very much his advocate um, would you know, despite the evidence you know would not you know would wouldn't consider the fact that her bunny as she called him was anybody but but an innocent man who was being you know cr- cruelly um, incarcerated and it would pay for his life for crimes that he didn't commit yada yada yada, yada. Mm-hmm. and she finally um, uh, had a child by him, uh, conceived either in the, a restroom or behind a, a water fountain uh, on a weekend visit to the prison. Um, and I, um, I, when I was getting ready to, to publish the book, Hugh and I were getting ready to publish the book, we, uh, we told her what we knew uh, and let her hear some of the tapes and said, you know, he's, he's guilty, Carol. And, um, uh, Sorry to say it, but that's what we're going to say in the book, and that was the end of our relationship. We uh, never saw her again, uh, and uh, there, there was a report within the last week or two that she had died in one of those online uh, online uh, tabloid deals. I don't know if it's true or not, but the story was that she she died last year of, of uh, septicemia. So, yeah, it's and I don't know where their daughter is. Yeah, yeah. Say what? I've heard that too, but. Uh... Yeah, yeah. No, no confirmation. Yeah, I, no, I and I have you know I, I have I have not exchanged a word with her in twenty five years, so I I really don't know. And and their daughter, whatever happened? So do we know for sure that that was his child? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There was there. Yeah. He well, she she conceded to me that the her daughter named Rosa was was Ted's. I mean, she told me how how they did it. Um, and uh, I, I never met the child. Uh, she's, good Lord, she's in her 30s now, um, yeah, but, or nearly so, but, but or Steve, 40s, it, actually. Yeah. It, is it not possible, though, that she's one of these super fans and, and had a child and wants to attribute it to Ted Bundy? Because given his stature, you know, given given his reputation, I would like to think, working in the corrections field, that they would keep a little bit closer eye on Ted Bundy, and and he's not going to be getting some behind the water fountain. Well, the story she told me was that the 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 death row guys had a little slush fund that they all contributed to, and 
they would take turns bribing one of the the guards into looking the other way. Oh boy. Uh, when they ducked into the, the the men's room or the 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 toilet or whatever. I again I. I don't have the, I, I didn't, there's no DNA. There's, I mean, it's, it was completely Carol's word. There are photographs of her, of the three of them together, uh, taken at the prison, uh, along with her son, Jamie. Um, and there is a little girl that looks a lot like, uh, Carol and a lot like Ted. Um, uh, I tried to find her once and, uh, ended up in Key West for all places. <laughs> running down something that <laughs> spent a lot of money and and uh, got nowhere on it, but she's you know so she if she was born like I think maybe two eighty three so she's you know she's in her late thirties now um, if you know your skepticism is well taken um, I can't prove uh, that she's Ted's daughter but it's it's just uh, it's just sort of an accepted uh, uh, an accepted yeah. fact. Uh- you know, uh, oddly enough, it would be cool if it was, but uh, again, I, I am so skeptical knowing, you know, how prisons work. But then again, I could be wrong. You broke into a prison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to. I was going to remind you that uh, that I, you know, was waltzing in and out of that place for six months, um, <laughs> and uh, so it's a, uh, you know, it's not impossible. You know, and but you know, it, and you know, Ted. Ted, when he wanted to be, when he was putting it on, was really personable. Now, don't forget that he escaped from two lockups mm-hmm. in the state of uh, of uh, Colorado. Now, these were not high security facilities, but they the 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 guards just basically ignored him. Um, well, actually, it's not two lockups. One lockup, and the second floor, uh, the second floor uh, courtroom in the courthouse. So yeah, that he wasn't actually in, in his cell when he went, but, uh, and he, um, he was very good at operating, you know, sort of below, below the, uh, below the radar, obviously. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, that that's true. Considered, yeah. I mean, he, he, he could assume, um, uh, personalities, uh, he had he was chameleon like in his ability to change his looks, and he was very conscious of that. Um, Ted, you know, Ted operated uh, kind of like a ghost, um, and he or a shapeshifter, I guess you might say. So I, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I, I would not swear that 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 he in fact fathered this child on on uh, death row, but I did see a letter. Um, in Ted's handwriting, um, that you know that was purportedly to her some years ago. So he thought that she was his daughter. Now maybe Carol pulled off one of the more interesting hoaxes of the last uh, thirty or forty years. But anyway, that's uh, that's it's probably one of the guards. That's my story, and I'm st- and I'm sticking <laughs> with it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Now, that's a good story. That's a little more likely too. Yeah. Well. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, it, is. it is. I wouldn't be surprised with any of those. It could be anything, no. you know. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so maybe, maybe uh, before we go, t- talk about maybe how you and Hugh actually decide got into the prison. That, that's a story that I find very interesting. How do you mean? Well, th- that you, um, the way you got your um, license, like how 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 you were getting in and out of the prison for six months. Well, it was it was pretty simple. Uh, uh, Vic Africano, whom everybody there knew because he was a criminal lawyer, so he had a lot of clients in the joint. He walked he walked me in one day. Uh, he was g- going to visit Ted, and uh, he introduced me to the uh, prison authorities as uh, an investigator uh, with Ted's um, with Ted's uh, 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 appeals attorneys and shook their hands and they shot, looked at my IDs and said, great. And I went in with, with Vic and then Vic and I left and I, next time I went by myself and, um, uh, they, you know, they always wanted to see my ID and, you know, they always put me through the, the Sally port with the metal detector and, you know, always sign in as well. You know, 
they were really good at uh, making sure I was the person I said I was. Um, but nobody ever said anything more about my, you know, how's, how are the appeals going or anything like that. I just <laughs> went in with the tape recorder and, and I, and it was, it, 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 I got so paranoid because I just, I couldn't believe I was getting away with it. And I was expecting any moment for them to walk in and, you know, throw a belly chain on Ted and, and say, uh, Mr. Me Chow, we're going to put you in your own little room, you know? <laughs> uh, and I, and I just, I mean, it was, it, it, this thing, it was like a, a cloud over me for, I just knew they were going to catch me. Um, <laughs> and they didn't, uh, thank goodness. How exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah. Are you- are you happy with the Bundy tapes uh, and how it, it come out uh, on Netflix and everything? Like, is it is it a good job? I think so. Um, you know, Hugh and I sat on those th- those tapes for thirty some years. Uh, just small snippets of them had had been used in some in programs occasionally, uh, but we had never given anybody anybody. Uh, access to all of them. That includes the, the FBI. Um, but, you know, uh, Joe Berlinger, the guy who directed the, the, the series, and I have had conversations going way, way back. He was interested in Ted a long time ago. And, uh, I, you know, I was familiar with some of the documentary stuff that he had done. And so I got, I had trust in him. Um, and, I thought that that you know, uh, it, it, if we were ever going to do it, uh, a four-hour format uh, would certainly be enough time to get you know to get into the subtleties of, of, of the story um, and 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 to hear Ted talk. Um, so uh, with, with you know with some reservations, but generally feeling you know pretty good about, about Joe and what he wanted to do, Hugh and I uh, signed up, and uh, we're, you know, uh, I think I think it's, in my experience, and I, I and from my perspective, uh, it is it is the first and only uh, uh, screen treatment of Ted that really gets into his head, uh, and he gets into his head because that's where I spent six months, and Hugh spent another four, I mean, it's a it's a very claustrophobic story. Uh, have you watched the program yet? Have you seen it? I have. Yeah, I've seen all four episodes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, would you agree with me that that sometimes you, you you screaming to get out from under Ted's head? You know, you know that, that when he cuts to when he no really when he cuts to these panoramic views of the West and showing cars and all like that. I, I found myself holding my breath. You know, and you know, and I obviously knew what the, you know what the story was, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really inside Ted. Um, so yeah, uh, if, if you're into that sort of thing, uh, that shows for you. <laughs> well, yeah, this, uh, I certainly, uh, seem to be, uh, into that sort of thing and <laughs> I don't know why, but it, it's yeah. true crime. <laughs> true. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh. Now, um, how about you give out your um, website address and any contact information you want people to have, and we'll yeah. also have it up on our website. Yeah, it's uh, it's just stephenmeshow.com. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.